good morning and thank you for being here. Uh, we are here to discuss, I, I'm Soteris Nikas from Bloomberg News in Athens, and we're here to discuss the, impact, the worst impact in economy and trade with Ms. Megan Green, Senior Fellow at the Mosavar Rahmani Center for Business and Government at Harvard Kennedy School, and Mr. Nikos Vetas, uh, General Director at Foundation for Economic and Industrial Research, known as UV, and of course Professor at the Athens University of Economics and Businesses. So let me start by saying that uh, you know, Ukraine and Russia are uh, export half of sunflower oil and more than and seeds and more than 25% of wheat. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's, Russia is a heavy supplying Europe with gas. So, Ms. Green, in this context, uh, does, uh, this, uh, what does this war mean uh, for European and global economy? Yeah, so Europe is disproportionately affected by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think most importantly is energy. You all probably know that the EU gets 40% of its gas from Russia, 30% uh, of its oil, 50% of its coal, or did until it announced a, a coal ban, um, finally. So that's, that's the biggest cost. Um, Europe was already facing higher inflation before Russia invaded Ukraine, partly because Gazprom was winding down its gas supplies starting last summer. Um, but this really exacerbates that uh, and is driving inflation much higher than any economist thought that inflation would go. But that's not the only implication. Russia is a huge exporter, not only of wheat and sunflower oil, also fertilizer. Um, so there could be food insecurity that won't hit Russia, I'm sorry, Europe as much as it will the Middle East and North Africa. But Russia also exports palladium, aluminum, and nickel, and those are key inputs into batteries and semiconductor chips. And so. If you've tried to buy a car, it's, it's been difficult. It's going to get a whole lot harder. It was so, already difficult. You exactly. It's, it's going to get worse. Um, so it exacerbates a lot of the supply chain issues that we've seen. We've already seen Germany, in particular, has had supply chain issues even since Russia invaded Ukraine because its supply chains are hooked into Eastern Europe, which have been affected. German business confidence fell the most in March that it has ever fallen on record. Um, and so. Most economists expected Europe to grow very slowly in the first quarter, but then to pick up in the second and third quarter as Omicron was behind us. That's no longer the case. So unfortunately, I think the scenario we're looking at is no to low growth in Europe alongside really high inflation. And that's every central bank's worst nightmare uh, because they don't have tools to do anything about that. If they hike rates to lean against inflation, they'll kill off any growth. If they don't, It'll support growth, but that will drive, you know, inflation will just drive higher. And so it's a stagflationary scenario. And that's my base case scenario for Europe in particular. Um, the risks are higher elsewhere of stagflation, but I, don't, I think the US will avoid that. We'll discuss about yeah. monetary policy, but let me turn to Mr. Vettes. And I would like to ask you what are the industries, what are the sectors that will be most affected according to your analysis and your opinion? The, the quick answer is uh, energy and everything that is heavily relying on energy, as uh, Megan explained. Uh, but that's only the first level. I think the effect is going to be mostly horizontal in the sense that um, the biggest fear is that we are going to see investment uh, backing down in many sectors. Um, investment relies uh, primarily on three things. Um, one is the cost of money. Um, there the news is mixed because nominal interest rates are expected to increase, but real interest rate might actually decrease because of the heavy inflation. Um, then it's projected demand, and we don't know what type of a world we're going to have in a few months. Uh, so investors do not know whether there is going to be demand for whatever they, they are preparing. And finally, uh, investment, especially in a post-Eurozone crisis and the post-COVID world, relies on uncertainty. And what we see now is very heavy uncertainty. So I'm not saying that we are, going, we are not going to have investment for 2022, but I'm saying that for the, for the next months, what one expects is that uh, many serious investment projects, small and large, are just going to be put on hold. Um, for Europe, this is an issue. For Greece, this is double uh, the issue. Now, if, if you wanted to go down the list of sectors, we could do this if you want down the road. Um, for energy, it isn't just you know, a hiccup. Uh, 
because for energy, what we are going through now um, is, is essentially like a moment of truth. Uh, we, we, the politicians around the world, but especially European politicians, have told the people over the last few years that the green transition is a win-win. Uh, more recently, we realized that it, is, it might be a win-win, but only in the longer run. In the short run, there is a transition cost. And part of the plan was that we would be relying on Russian energy to cover the transition cost. In fact, there is also an interesting twist here, which is we have been telling the Russians that we will be needing you badly now, but in five, ten years, you will be useless to us. Yes which strategically is not necessarily the smartest thing to do. But leaving this aside, this basically says um, we are already recalculating uh, how we're going to make the transition towards green. So all this makes a very interesting uh, mix. Uh, if you want to add to this high debt levels, if you want to add to this that we have not necessarily, we're not completely done with COVID, uh, things are interesting. Uh, nice way to put it. So, do you think, Mrs. Uh, Morgan, that Mrs. Green, that uh, we should forget globalization as we know it? Yeah, there is a discussion around this issue. Yeah. Is it a, a discussion, you know, based on some real facts or? Yeah. So this is a question I'm getting constantly now, um, and I don't think that global. I don't think we're deglobalizing, and I don't think that we will off the back of this. Um, I and many other economists put out a narrative when the pandemic hit that global supply chains would regionalize and we would onshore and nearshore production. Um, but no one really went and checked to see if that was true. So I, I did recently. Uh, and there's no magic index for globalization, unfortunately. But there are a bunch of other data series you can look at. Uh, and none of them really suggest that we're deglobalizing. Um, so if you look at world trade to GDP, it increased for years and then flattened out, um, you know, about 10 years ago. But it's flattened out. It hasn't really sunk. Um, so we're not deglobalizing. If you look at FDI flows, um, so the sticky money, between the U.S. and China, they hit record highs last year. Um, if you look at the hot money and look at net capital flows, um, they've been pretty good up until Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, and then uh, we've seen net capital outflows from China, so it's too early to say whether that's a new trend or if actually that might be Russian money leaving China. We'll see. Um, if you look at survey data asking companies, you know, American or European companies operating in China, for example, whether they plan on leaving, overwhelmingly they say no. Uh, they want access to one of the biggest markets in the world and also access to sophisticated supply chains. So. I don't think that we are deglobalizing. I think we're globalizing more slowly. And I think that will continue to be the case. This trend began long before the pandemic hit, of course. It depends a lot, though, on where China and India fall in this conflict. Um, so far, China in particular has taken a really neutral stance. Um, but Chinese companies are worried about secondary sanctions. Um, they're worried about the US imposing sanctions on them because They've done business with Russia. And so even though officially China hasn't joined the sanctions, most companies are actually upholding them because they don't want to be locked out of the dollar system effectively. Um, and, and I think that will continue to be the case. If China were to go ahead and, and bail Russia out effectively, then I think supply chains might uh, start to, to repattern. It also takes a while for supply chains to repattern. So, TCIM, a huge Taiwanese semiconductor company, is building a factory in Arizona. It won't be operational for another four years. So it's not to say it, it won't happen, that we'll eventually deglobalize, but I don't think it's happening yet, and I don't think it will we'll as a result of this crisis. OK. So Mr. Vetters, you referred before to the green transition. For how many years do you think that we're going to experience all these impacts from this situation uh, until the end of the green transition? Is this a benchmark? I don't know, and I'm not sure that anybody does. Um, the, the, there is an issue with the green transition, which is as we may be making our energy mix and our production greener, uh, at the same time, we are consuming more, and we are becoming more and more in terms of population. So the hard numbers is that um, we may be trying to um, slow down the effect that we have, 
but the effect is still there in terms of CO2 emissions and all that. Um, we, we, I, I do want to say a word on, on the globalization issue because it is also related to this. Um, my sense is also very similar to Megan's. I think the forces, the way production takes place for the last 20, 30 years, it's very hard to be undone. So we are going to see less of a push for more globalization, but I don't think we're going to see going back. We're, perhaps we're going to be more selective. Um, I, I have two or three thoughts on this that are um, partly economic but also partly uh, political. So one thing is that we, we, we do have to look back 40 years back. Um, going after the two oil crises of the late 70s and starting in the 80s, um, the world collectively got into an almost 25 to 30 years path of almost uninterrupted growth, the great moderation, we called it as the economist, um, with uh, average GDP growth around the world being significantly positive every year. This was uh, due to at least three factors. One was technology, incorporation of computers into productivity and all that. So there is, so looking forward, there is a question mark about technology, especially about technology regarding energy, uh, hydrogen and, and all that. That's the other thing that we, we saw was uh, peace relative to what we had before and the incorporation of larger and larger areas into global trade. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet bloc, then China coming in, um, all that were massive forces that made everybody take for granted that we're going to um, produce cheaper and, and, and consume more every year. Now, the one thing that the Russian invasion to Ukraine and the war does, uh, if, if, if you look at it, if you, if you step back and look at it, what is this? One thing that it signals is that there has been a massive failure of what we can call the West, and that's the Europe, that, that's Europe, the, the, the Western Europe, what, what, and, and the US. US, to deal with Russia. Yeah. And one thing, if, if, I'm, if I'm looking at this object, because we don't know how to deal with this now, are we going to give in and, and, and tell Russia that, all right, fine, we're going to have a de facto split Ukraine, but this is still going to be something that is going to be a big stain in, in West uh, policy? Are we going to cut them off, which is also very dangerous? So we don't know how to deal with it. And, and the path so far has been a failure. We have to admit this. It's now, basically what Mr. Draghi said yesterday. Do you want air condition or peace? Uh, mm. But no, no matter what, I'm, it's one question what you do now. But I'm just looking back in the last, let's say, 10 or 15 years, and I say that we failed in some way. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because there is a bigger game that involves China. And if the West is going to deal with China the way it dealt with Russia, mm -hmm. then we have bigger problems ahead. So the question, green transition, globalization, and all that, at the bottom of it, and Megan already hinted about you know, China and India, uh, to what extent we're going to have a continuous smooth incorporation of these huge economies that are not necessarily, all of them, democracies the way we think of what democracy is, into global trade and the global financial system. So th these are big, big questions that once we are done one way or the other with the peak of the Ukrainian crisis, we, we really have to look ourselves in the mirror. And I'm not sure these have easy answers. Uh so is it uh, fair to say that we need to, to learn to live with higher prices? And if so, how can we deal with this situation? Is the rate hike, I mean, in terms of monetary policy that you mm -hmm. referred before, is it a uh, rate hike a solution? Uh, because you said that the, the central banks will have to decide whether we have a, a big depression or yeah. how can they deal with this? Yeah, unfortunately, um Central banks can't do anything about supply side shocks. So the ECB can't do anything about higher natural gas prices. Um, it can't do anything about China's zero COVID policy, which has seen factory shutdowns um, and, and regional shutdowns. Uh, 
And so what the central bank can do is to try to anchor inflation expectations in the hope that they kind of buy themselves enough time for some of these factors which may are hopefully transitory um, to pass and ease so that inflation comes back down. So um, no, the ECB hiking rates won't address high energy costs, um, but it, it will bring down other types of inflation. I mean, as, as we've heard, you know, energy is used to make pretty much everything, so all prices are going to go up off the back of this. Um, it'll, it, central banks can deal with aggregate demand management, they call it, so they can slow growth down, they can slow down demand so that we're buying less. Um, that risks tipping us into a recession, um, but the hope for central banks is that they can at least anchor expectations so you don't end up in an upward inflationary spiral. I think, Mr. Vedas, you want to say something on, on that issue? No, for starters, let me echo what Megan said, because that, that's not necessarily a clear point amongst also central bankers, right? Uh, your instinct is inflation goes up, let's make money uh, more expensive. It, it is true that uh, we, we had phenomenal liquidity over the, during the pandemic and even going into the pandemic. QE has been going on in Europe forever and, and all that. But this is, this is a textbook supply shock that we have now. And to try to, um, to, 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 to undo this by making money um, uh, costlier, that, that, that's not the way to do it. So central banks have to be very careful in the way and, and actually all uh, anchoring expectations, because now everybody's at a loss, is, is the, the big service they can give. Um, about costs, actually you, you asked if, if prices will be going yes. up, right? Now. If we have a, a new balance. A, 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 a price by itself means nothing, right? A price relative to what? <laughs> so it, it's always um, relative to what? Uh, for sure, it looks like over the next at least two couple of years, anything relying on energy will be costlier. And so prices would also go up. Uh, it's unclear what this means for maritime shipping. Um, it's very clear what this means for manufacturing in Europe where um, manufacturing had the comparative, had a, was at a disadvantage in Europe for many reasons. Um, and we have been lagging behind. We have been pushing manufacturing away, effectively, uh, with energy costs being, um, in Europe, um, basically the highest globally. So if, if now it becomes even higher, because energy cost hits Europe the worst, it doesn't hit the US as much. Um, so this, 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 this is pushing you in the wrong uh, direction. The answer to all this, because we are talking about margins that are not, they are very large, but they are not uh, impossible to defend. We're talking about a two or three or four percent increase, is to um, basically run faster when it comes to issues that have to do uh, with uh, productivity, where Europe overall is, is, is still lagging. Um, that, that's, that's the way to, to, to defend. But in the short run, yes, uh, there is going to be a cost. And I think that um, it's, since we, before we told central bankers what to do, we can also now tell politicians what to do. I was going to ask about fiscal policy. <laughs> uh, I, I think what we can tell politicians is that they should include um, a larger past, a, a larger part of reality and frankness in their statements. If we're going through a war situation, we have to tell the European citizens that there is going to be a cost. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the cost may be higher uh, if we even try to do the, the right thing in the long run. Yeah. So, so, so we, we have, I mean, because we had a lot of that also during COVID. COVID was a huge cost, and uh, still we have been saying that's fine. It, it wasn't fine. We accumulated huge fiscal deficits. Yeah, I would say it's also important that politicians be honest with people about the costs of the green transition. So politicians have been selling it everywhere as a win-win. 
it's not a win-win, actually. If, if you... Someone has to pay at the end. If you effectively start to price in the cost of carbon, which we've considered, you know, at zero for a long time, things are going to get more expensive. And this is, this is what happened with globalization as well. Every politician sold it as a win for everyone, and it wasn't a win for everyone. And when people discovered that, there was a real backlash against globalization. Um, we don't have time for that kind of backlash with the green transition, so I think it's important that politicians are upfront. On the fiscal side, though, I think there's a lot politicians can do to subsidize energy costs, for example. Um, a lot of investment needs to happen in order to get anywhere close to the net zero targets. Um, and I feel, bringing the monetary policy and fiscal policy together, I feel that the ECB and the European Commission are in a bit of a game of chicken again. Um, because the ECB is insistent on winding down its bond buying purchases b before it hikes rates, and it's eager to hike rates in the face of really high inflation. If the ECB gets rid of QE, it doesn't really have any usable tools for fragmentation. So if Greek yields start creeping up, which they have, by the way, or Italian yields even worse, the ECB doesn't really have tools to address that. Um, I think they're, also, they're hoping that the Commission will put together a new package, a new recovery fund, for this exogenous shock that we're seeing. Um, and, and so there's a nightmare scenario where the ECB winds down its QE program. It, it was only able to launch it because we were facing deflation. We're now in a, a very inflationary world, so I think it would be really hard to reinstitute QE once it's wound down. Um, if the EU doesn't have tools to, uh, sorry, the ECB doesn't have tools to address fragmentation and the Commission doesn't come up with a recovery package for the massive spending that will have to happen, um, also on defense in Europe, uh, then I do think we'll see a lot of fragmentation and, and no way to fund what needs to be funded. Now that, uh, yeah. J just two second thing uh, to, to clarify. The, the fact that we realize the green transition is not necessarily win-win that doesn't mean that it, 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 it is that, that, it, yeah. that, that we shouldn't push for it. Oh, agree. No, no, yeah, no. you just need to be honest yeah. about the cost and and figure out how to you know how to support the losers. And 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 there is one further complication now. I mean, there there is no point for Greece to unilaterally, let's say, or for a small European economy, lower down CO2 emissions, if there isn't a global understanding that China and Russia and, uh, every, and Indonesia and everybody else is going to follow. So the political consequences of the war might be that there is going to be a slowdown in this type of coordination. And, 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 and that changes the equation a little bit. Uh, do you see any other political consequences like populism, rising populism? I mean, we're talking about losers, so I guess this will be the taxpayers, so and it, it will hit harder to the poorest uh, uh, people. So, do you think that this will uh, help populism rise again in Europe? Uh, Who are you asking? Uh, uh, both, basically. <laughs> I would like the opinion from both of you. Yeah, I think it's very pos possible. I mean, the economists and analysts have called the end of populism or peak populism a thousand times, and yet populists keep ending up coming back into government uh, in waves that tend to match business cycle waves, really. So I do think that there is real opportunity for grassroots movements and populists um, to, to highlight that there have been losers from all of these things uh, and to gain support. I mean, the French elections are on Sunday. It's not looking totally, uh, my base case is that Macron will win, but I think it will be much closer than the markets are pricing right now. Le Pen has changed her anti-European rhetoric, but she's still very populist. Um, yeah. It's one example, but I think. France elections, though, are too close to the event. I mean, we haven't seen all the yeah. consequences to. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Vettes? Uh, I, I, I guess there are many levels at which one has to be worried about this. One is whether you do have, through our uh, electoral system, uh, clearly populist uh, powers, left or right, that uh, gain strength. That's one. Um, the other is what perhaps, I'm not sure if political scientists have a term, but the, populist, the populism within the, um, the core political scene. Mm. And that has to do with uh, being frank and being able to um, organize consensus so that you tell the citizens, you, you, have, you, you agree with the citizens is the right way to put it, 
that uh, there, there will be a cost so that we have a collective benefit. And for that, I fear that uh, th there is an issue over the last, let's say, 10 years in, in, in most of the Western world. And th there is a third level at which one may want to be worried, which is that um, with, you know, s starting our, our thought with what is happening now with Russia, you have large parts um, of, uh, of the global economy that uh, operate in ways that we do not necessarily believe is the textbook case of democracy when it comes to freedom within the country, when it comes to free speech, when it comes to uh, everything. And, uh, and these are huge economies globally. There are large economies also next door to us. Um, and if you add them up, these are economic systems that do not have the, in quote, constraints that the democracy has. They can plan ahead. They don't have an opposition. Um, and, and if people in the West see that economic progress in such areas is faster than what it is in us, because in the short run it can happen. In the long run, the way to grow is good institutions, uh, transparent public sector, free markets. But in the short run, you could have uh, other regimes that uh, grow faster. Mm -hmm. And politically, that might strengthen voices um, also in our countries. Uh, uh, can I just add one yeah, thing? Um, inflation is basically a regressive tax, um, and particularly when inflation hits food and energy prices, because pretty much everyone has to buy those things. So inequality has been exacerbated quite a lot by the pandemic. Now, if you have high inflation off the back of that, that will hurt low-income households uh, more than it will high-income households. And so that, could, that just means that those who have fallen behind will fall further behind. And that leaves a, a population pretty ripe for populists. And, and a minor point on that, uh, you mentioned inflation. And you're right, it, it's going to hit the lower scale of the households more. Uh, there is also a question of what it's going to do to savings. Mm -hmm because you know, the interest rate effectively is going to be negative. The average Western household is going to see, if, if, if the, the average household that has you know, 10,000 euros in a, in, a, in, a, in a European bank is going to see 5 or 6 or 7 percent of that gone by the end of the year. So the incentive to save, the incentive to keep it within the system, uh, rather than to rely on other sorts of global savings is also an issue. So we have another three minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. So far, we're discussing about all the negative impacts. Uh, can I have a more a positive and more optimistic view as, uh, from, from both of you as a wrap up as we're wrapping up the, our discussion? What will be the best case scenario for you, for example? Yeah, I mean, that's what you have to do is scenario plan around this. And so the best case scenario is that uh, this conflict is resolved quickly that the supply chain issues that we were already seeing before Russia invaded Ukraine uh, are mitigated, um, that energy costs go down, but that uh, Europe is still highly incentivized to undergo a green transition, puts together the funding for that, for the necessary investment to make it happen quickly. So everyone's learned the lesson that we can't just rely on Russia for, for energy. Um, that lesson is crucially learned, but inflation comes down because a lot of the transitory supply shocks that we've seen are abate. Uh, that's probably the best case scenario. Mr. Vettas? One thing to note is that the, the, the global economy has, has this remarkable ab ability to, to, to absorb a lot. Um, it did absorb Brexit. We thought that Brexit, you know, before it, it happened, it might be the end of Europe or the end of the world. It, it wasn't. Uh, it did absorb uh, the Trump rhetoric that is going to cut off China. Um, it, it did absorb the high uh, Eurozone uh, debt and all that. Uh, so it can easily absorb this. Um, yes, there, there is going to be costs. Uh, yes, there are uncertainties. But uh, assuming, which has to be the central scenario, that this one way or the other, the hostilities are going to um, uh, I'm not sure it's going to end very fast, but at least it's going to slow down. Um, if, if this happens, 
soon before the summer. Uh, I'm saying the summer because this is also a heavy tourism season for a lot of the southern Europe. Uh, this, this could end up being uh, manageable. The consequences, I think, as we discussed, uh, are more worrisome uh, in, the, in, the, in the long run, I guess, the, or the question marks. So it's one minute, so I will just thank you for this discussion. It was my pleasure, and I hope everyone enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.